Okay, good morning here in London and to the world. We're going to be talking about dumbbell amplifiers um, and we're going to be talking about the man himself. Just so it's kind of like a fun video just to really set the record straight on why these amplifiers are so amazing and, and you know, why the guy's an incredible amp builder. So um, I'm not going to get into details of the history and so forth, but there's a few things I wanted to say about um, dumbbell and his amps. Basically, um, let me have a sweet of coffee first. Mm. Ah, that's good. So basically, dumbbell amplifiers, I mean, you know, they're amazing amplifiers if you're looking for that, this certain sound. And the best way I could describe them is they're kind of like a hi-fi, it's a hi-fi sound, so it's kind of some of the best blackface Fender hi-fi tones, um, which are, you know, um, sh it shouldn't sound sterile, should, because the whole deal with Dumble was that he was using old parts um, that he'd collected from old amps such as Music Man amps or you know Fender amps. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But you know, so it's, a, it's an amp that's new, obviously, but it's got old parts in it, and it sounds like an amp's really worn in. And you know, um, you know, so for example, if you have a great blackface amp, Super Reverb, from the 1960s it's going to sound great because the transformers are worn in everything's kind of worn in everything that's gone wrong has gone wrong the parts have, that needed to be replaced have been replaced and you know the amp sounds good not all of them do but you know that's kind of the ethos of um was Dumble was thinking in his mind was something very hi-fi so if you don't like hi-fi amps if you like saggy tweed amps with a slow response then a Dumble's going to be no good for you but if you're looking for something fast with a fast attack um, then a dumbbell's going to be great. I mean, I was having problems with old black face Fender amps that I was using when I was younger. In 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 the UK, I was playing with loud drummers, and you know, if I was playing something fast, I felt that the amp was kind of sagging on me. You know, even the drop in volume, and you know, the amp wasn't keeping up with my playing. And so when I got the when I got this amp here, um, and by the way, I've just taken the name out here because I'm I'm not trying to promote this amp. I've just got it here, so I, that's the reason the name's blocked out, but anyone who knows me knows what amps I play. Also, I mean, Free of the Tone, this just happens to be a t-shirt I'm wearing, so I'm not advertising Free of the Tone, but um, I do love Free of the Tone, they're great products, but anyway, that aside. So I was looking for something that was that was going to, you know, I'd pluck a note and, and the amp wouldn't bottom out of me, you know, with like a low E note. And I wanted it fast reacting, so that I had a need for a certain type of amp. That's why I went for the ODS, the Overdrive Special kind of design, because I, I wanted that fast response. I wanted that chimey hi-fi sound. You've got companies like Two Rock, which are you know are completely based on that. Not completely; they've obviously morphed into something else, but they were based on that Dumble circuit. So what Dumble did was come up with this really cool circuit which he based on old RCA designs, which were probably made in the 1930s by the scientists and engineers working at RCA, which then Leo Finder took. And then kind of Dumble's taken that concept and then refined that concept, um, put his own ideas in there. And that's his platform, which he can then bring in different um, parts to build a circuit, which sounds beautiful. And anyone that's played a real Dumble will know that. I've, I've I played a real Dumble here in the UK, and um, hopefully I'll do a video on this Overdrive Special amp that I have access to. Um, hopefully there'll be a future video. So you know, if you've played a real Dumble, um, then you know that it's going to be, it, you know, that it's a great amp. And a lot of people that are, you know, mocking Dumble and his amps, I've never played a Dumble, you know, and aren't the right people to even own a Dumble because, like I said. With a double amplifier, you need to have a, a, a. There needs to be a reason why you play that amp, you know. So another thing, Don will have this basic circuit, which he would then tweak for the player. You know, he'd sort of like measuring a suit for you, and and um, but everything was a one-off. You know, he couldn't recreate exactly the same amp because he's playing guitar as he's soldering it in the the resistors and the capacitors. He's actually playing the guitar to to morph the sound. So that's what you're going to get with somebody like Dumble. It is an amp that's very unique, but it's tweaked to perfection. You know, it's not a, it's not just assembled and there, there you go. There's your amp. You know, he's listening to it, and if it doesn't sound right, he's going to change that part. So the Dumble amp is a summation of all the parts and, 
and listening to his ears. So if you don't have Dumble's brain and his ears, you're never ever going to be able to make a Dumble amp. It's just not going to happen. You might get close. This amp that I have here is, is close. You know, I've done some clips. You can see some clips on my YouTube channel here. Um, I think there's one video before this one. And you can see that I've got close to uh, the kind of Robin Ford sound, you know. But it's not Dumble. It's never going to be Dumble. Because you, unless the maker, the builder of, of this amp, you know, could get Dumble's brain in his brain, then, you know, he can't do that. So it's going to be his sound. And it's going to be slightly different to Dumble sound because he hears things differently to Dumble. So you're never ever going to have a Dumble sounding amp unless Dumble builds it. That's the main point. So that's really why they've become expensive because, you know, um, you know, unless Dumble built it, it's, it's not going to be, you know, you're not going to get that sound. Now, this is another point, which is something you need to think about. You might spend all that money on this Dumble amp, but it might sound shit. So why does it sound shit? Well, every single amp was a one-off. Like I said, they all sounded different. So for example, even Robin Ford has one amp, which is his main amp, which has green switches. You can tell it because it's got green switches here. And he tried to get his other amp, which I think has white switches. And he gave that to Dumbo and said, can you copy my main amp? Make it exactly the same. And um, Dumble said, yeah, I can do that. But he couldn't. So he couldn't even do, he couldn't even clone or copy his own amps. It's a very difficult thing to do because they're one-off designs. <clears throat> um, but what you are getting is an amp built by Dumble, but you know using his ears and to tweak it into that certain sound that I think nobody else can really get. Um, so then we come to you know why spend a hundred thousand dollars on one of these amps or whatever they cost now. Well, it's the same as the Les Paul, the Gibson Les Paul. Why spend you know, three hundred thousand dollars on a on a fifty nine Les Paul, because you know some people say, well, it's old wood and it's it's a limited guitar, and and then you have to say, well, you know, Peter Green's Les Paul was only seven years old when he played it, so it would be like me playing a guitar from two thousand and twelve. The reason is supply and demand. That's the real reason because there's there was only a certain amount of Les Pauls made. And he became famous. Same with train wreck. There was only a certain amount of train wrecks made by Ken Fisher, and of course, when it come to Dumble. There's only a few made by Dumble. But um, the problem is, is if you have a, a Dumble amp now, you've got to remember that all the parts in the amp are going to drift. So you might have the bass sound, the circuit, Dumble circuit, is obviously there. But then the parts are drifted, so the amp's going to sound different. It's not going to sound the same as when Dumble sold it to you 20 years ago, 30 years ago. That's why Robin Ford sends his amplifiers back to Dumble every year or every two years, because parts drift and the amp sounds changes. Same with Larry Carlton. That's why he stopped using Dumble amps, because Larry couldn't send his amps back to Dumble for whatever reason, so he had to go to Blue Tone. This is actually made by Blue Tone. This is a Dumbleator. So Blue Tone, he's called, I think his name is Brandon Montgomery. He he had to build um, Larry's amps and tweak them because Dumble couldn't repair them or tweak them, whatever. So you're not really, if you're buying, if you're spending a hundred grand on Dumble amp, you're not really spending a hundred grand for the best amp in the world. Okay, you're spending an amp because Dumble built it. You know, the same with the Gibson Les Paul. You're not spending three hundred thousand quid because the guitar is the greatest guitar ever made. No, you're spending 300 quid, 300,000 pounds because there was only two and a half thousand made. Yes, yeah, some sound amazing, but some are going to sound not so amazing, you know. So, for example, this is a Japanese handmade Les Paul, which costs a couple of grand, three grand or whatever. For me, this is the best Les Paul I've ever played. You know, this is my favorite Les Paul, even though it was made in Japan. It's got Honduras mahogany, it's got maple on it. Um, but, you know, it's the same as, it's the same when it comes to the Dumble. You know, Dumble built that amp. He may, may, maybe some of his amps, you know, he was having a bad year and some of the amps came out sounding, you know, crap. They might sound awful. You know, so then two years later, the owner would have to send it back to Dumble and say, look, this amp sounds terrible. I don't like it. Can you retweak it? Make it sound good. So what I've done with this one, I've sent this one back to the maker a few times. We've tweaked it and now it sounds like I want it to sound, you know. 
that's not to say in two years time when the parts drift the amp might sound a bit dead so then I need to send it back to the maker you know that's the kind of topology or design that Dumble had was that you know these parts drift and then the amp maybe you know doesn't the valves need changing the capacitor capacitors need replacing maybe some of the resistors drift you know so parts break so you know if you're buying an amplifier that's say 20 30 years old and it's a Dumble then you know be careful because you're not it might not sound any good and it might not sound the same way as when it left Dumble's house so I would say to people buying an amp maybe you know you need to think about that maybe you need to think about being able to contact Dumble, you know, and see if he's going to re, re, you know, retweak it for you, just like Robin does and Larry, and once did. So that's that's something to bear in mind. That's obviously not the case with a Gibson has bought guitar because you know once it's made, it's made. It's not the same as an amp. An amp has electrical parts in it which can drift. You know, a guitar is is just going to get kind of mellow, just get mellow with age. You know. So a lot of this kind of Dumble anti dumble sort of rhetoric has come about not through Dumble's fault because okay he was a kind of bespoke maker and he set his own rules about how much he wanted to you know charge me for for an amplifier and he would okay granted he was a bit of an eccentric man but you know we're all eccentric in some way or another you know no one's perfect but um the fact remains the guy's you know top of his game Dumble is you know, he can really build an amp and you only have to listen to Steve Ray Vaughan, Larry Carlton, you know, um, Little Feet or um, David Lindley, even Rykuda, my, you know, one of my favourite players, Rykuda used one. You know, all those guys were using these amazing sounding amps and they were a cut above Fender amps, they were a cut above Tweed amps, you know, for what they were doing, for the sound they wanted, they were a refined sound. And I think even Dumble, towards the end, he became more hi-fi and more hi-fi. And in the end, the amps, stuck, maybe maybe he went too far. He, he the, the cleans were too hi-fi. The overdrive became too smooth and too gainy because of the whole 80s sort of, you know, hair metal, um, rock, heavy rock thing. And, and maybe he went in that direction. But And, um, and maybe the early amps, you know, um, were very different. I think there's a certain, there's a golden period of Dumble Amps, which, you know, in the 80s, the 1980s, where he really, you know, refined what he did to, and it was just fantastic. It was, they were the best. So, um, you know, um, that's a, another point. So the kind of points I've made here in this video are just to say that, you know, Dumble is a brilliant designer and one of the best ever designers. You know, but bearing in mind, he built a lot of his work on top of Leo Fender and Leo Fender, you know, got the circuits and schematics from those engineers from RCA who, I don't even know who those guys were, but they were the geniuses that came up with the original valve amplifier designs, you know. And, um, but Dumble kind of really refined it and created almost a new kind of um, art in amp building, which was akin to building a jazz archtop guitar. So that's something you have to bear in mind. And um, the price has only come about because of, you know, um, probably a lot of the people that, that are spending this money, um, you know, probably don't even play the amps. They're not even played. They're just kind of kept as a, a trading, you know, object, you know, like you trade in antiques, you know. So the the average player in the street is never going to come close. So that's why I'm kind of lucky that I've actually been able to play one, you know. Um, so that aside, um, another thing I wanted to say about um, the, the whole Dumble thing is they've actually inspired a whole you know new generation of amplifiers like Fuchs, Two Rock, um, you know there's all kinds of amplifiers, uh, Morgans do one, Bruno, you know so many makers have copied what Dumble did but Dumble was the, the guy that started that whole kind of thing off so you know credit where credit's due, the, the guy is certainly you know you know he came with a new discipline you know a new style of building an amp where he, you know, he'd collect resistors and he'd collect all these different parts and he'd be trying, soldering in all these different parts into the amp until he got the sound that he wanted, you know, and that's that's why I always stress it. A lot of people don't realise that, you know, when Dumble is building an amplifier, he's sitting there with his guitar, he's strumming a chord, he's, or when he's doing the overdrive, shaping the overdrive, he's, he's, you know, playing a bend and then he's soldering in parts to get that sound. He's tuning the amp in. And a lot of people don't understand you know, Marshall do not do that. You know, you're not going to go to Marshall and the guy's 
soloing and then soloing in parts to make the amp sound better. That's not going to happen in Marshall. That's not what they do. You know, they have a design. You know, people make it that probably don't even like music, but they're good at soldering in parts into an amp. So that's the difference between Dumble and buying um, uh, an amp off a production line. You know, if you want to go down that rabbit hole and get an amp tuned by somebody to your specifications, like I did with this amp, then you know I wish you luck because it's it can be a real rocky road and cost you a lot of money. But if that's if the, that's a path you want to take, then so be it. So um, you know, th there's a lot to think about with the Dumble thing, but just the point of this video is just like saying you know, give respect where respects to you. Um, Dumble's a great man, great builder, and um, you know, he did some fantastic things for us guitar players and really kind of moved the technology forward. And um, we're still discovering new things that he's, he's done, you know. And um, and also, you know, um, before you want to comment on a Dumble, see if you can come play one, you know, play, see if you can find one to play. And also make sure that that one that you can play is, has been tweaked recently by Dumble because then it's going to really, really sound like the real deal. Um, failing that, you know, go to Fuchs, Andy Fuchs. I don't want to sort of advertise here because, you know, I have no affiliation with Andy Fuchs whatsoever or Two Rock. But Fuchs, Andy Fuchs and Bill Crenard at Two, Two Rock, those guys are fantastic. You know, they're really, really top of what they do. They're brilliant builders. You can go out and you can buy um, a kind of a Dumble amp, you know, Dumble inspired amp like that. So it's a good book if you want to know more about Dumble. <clears throat> it's uh, written by a German guy, I think, so it's pretty hard to read. <clears throat> you kind of have to kind of read between the lines, you know. Um, so I'm just going to have a sweet coffee. Um, you know, you've got things like, um, it's kind of cool to look at these, um, if I should show you here. It's kind of a cool book, it goes through all the kind of Dumble models. And um, what's actually interesting about it is... Um, you know, um, you know the speakers that he was using. He was using like ultra glancing speakers. That's the, they were the first speakers he, he used. Um, that's what I'm using. I'm using with one. Uh, um, I'm using two cabinets, a two by twelve cabinet, Celestians, which is a kind of Robert Ford thing. And then I'm using a, a um, an Altec Lansing G twelve sixty five because that's what Dumble first had. In you know, if you look at, for example, yeah. So the early amps, you can see there. A G um, a 417, which is a ceramic speaker, and I kind of use that because that it kind of evokes the earlier sort of Dumble type tones, and then uh, Dumble progressed to EV speakers. Um, I think he used JBLs as well, but he he then ended up using EV speakers and all his amplifiers, and they were his favourite speakers as well as Celestians. He he did have a love of um, <coughs> Celestian speakers, and I think Jensen's, you know. Um, but um, he's a very interesting guy, and I think one of the most interesting things for me about Dumble, which is, you know, we all want to be on social media. We all want to be, you know, showing off what we've done and what we've accomplished in our lives. But Dumble's sort of remained under the radar, and you've got to respect somebody that's, you know, decided to, you know, kind of drop off the grid. I always think that's really cool. You know, um, a lot of people maybe slag him off online or whatever. And he could come up and respond, but you know he's he's a pretty cool guy. Just remains quiet, does what he does. You know he's got a great circle of um, you know musician friends, and he works in. A, I think he does some stuff in his studio where he builds studio gear. So yeah, very interesting guy. And um, you know maybe um, if you're interested in the whole Dumble thing, you know do a bit of research first. Don't just listen to these bad um, you know videos where people are slagging him off, slagging the guy off. The guy really knew what he was doing, um, and he built some, you know, some incredible amps. And to this day, Robin Ford's still using his amps, and you know, quite a few other artists are as well. So um, yeah, hope that's um, interesting for you all. And just to give you another perspective on the whole Dumble thing, you know, um, and um, yeah, let me know if you want any more videos on on Dumble, and I can uh, or anything related to that, and uh, we can talk about that. Okay. Take care, see you on the road.